there are some drivers that in some way leave a mark in the history of motorsport, even if they didn't achieve a world championship or even if they didn't score a set of records never beaten afterwards. And uh, this sentence could be easily applied to the story of Eugenio Castellotti. An Italian driver born in the 30s in the city of Lodi, southeast from Milan, in the north region of the country, that literally from nothing has become a worldwide celebrated and recognized professional sports car and Formula One driver. In Italy, we are not famous for celebrating in a right manner our heroes. And uh, despite the number of victories for Eugenio Castellotti were not spare, but were quite consistent in his uh, short career, sometimes we tend to remember more often our most recent supposed heroes of Formula One. And we celebrate them and we remind them more than our big heroes we had in the 50s, like Eugenio Castellotti, Alberto Ascari or Luigi Mus. Considering also how the career of Eugenio Castellotti was born, because he was born as a sort of not legal son of the back then famous lawyer Francesco Castellotti that in the town of Lodi was a powerful lawyer, a powerful entrepreneur that had, at 59 years of age, a sort of clandestine story with a waitress working for his family, Angela Virginia, the mother of Eugenio, that back then was not even 18 years old. And just on the deathbed of Mr. Francesco Castellotti, the father finally recognized his son Eugenio as a legal son, leaving him all the fortune he amassed in his life. And at the end, Eugenio, from the night to the next morning, was a man that was gone to bed as a sort of poor man like many others of us. And the day after, did wake up as the richest man of the province of Lodi. And just to give you a footnote about it, once uh, his father died, to become the owner of all the fortune of the father, he had to pay 60,000 liras of inheritance taxes, something like 1 million today of euros of taxes to the Italian state to become the only owner of the succession of everything built and amassed by his father. And because Eugenio was young, because he was newly with a driver license, the first thing he did was to purchase a Ferrari 166 WM as a daily car, just to give you the perspective of his crazy life few years later, the end of the Second World War. We were back then, in 1949. And uh, with this fortune in the pocket, he started to use his uh, daily Ferrari to start to try his uh, racing career as a driver, because inside him, he knew he was more than uh, well cut for the motorsport. So once born the 10th of October 1930, around 1950, he started to dream and act like a future motorsport champion until his death happened today, 14th of March, but of the year 1957, exactly 65 years ago. The first notable year as a racing driver is the 1951, where with his personal Ferrari 166 WM, he did the Giro di Sicilia, the Tour of the Sicily, 
finished with the retirement. Some weeks later, he was there in the Mille Mille, finishing 50th overall, but 6th in class. Then there was the Coppa della Toscana, the Tuscany Cup, 3rd in class. Some weeks later, the Coppa d'Oro delle Dolomiti, the Golden Cup for the Dolomiti Mountains, with a retirement. At the end of the year, the Tour of the Calabria, third in class. As a privateer, the 51 was not bad at all. A year later, 1952, he paid 24 million of liras, that was around 450,000 euros nowadays, to loan, thanks to the Scuderia Guastalla, a Ferrari 2500, to participate again to the Tour of Sicily, finishing fifth overall and first of his class. Then again, the Gold Cup of Syracuse in the region of Sicily, with a Ferrari 2800, finishing first. Then there was the Grand Prix of the Circuit of Senigallia, again first. And the Portugal Grand Prix, dedicated this time to sports car, finishing first. And in the same year, arriving also second in the Monaco Grand Prix dedicated to sports car, second just after Vittorio Marzotto. Not bad for a privateer paying a private team for the 52 season of sports car. We arrive so to the year 1953, where he becomes the Italian champion for, for sports car type, arriving first. He participated and won also the 10 hours of Messina, still in Sicily, with a Ferrari 3000. At that point, the official Formula One and sports car team Lancia did see with Eugenio a potential winning driver and so asked the Italian driver to race for them the Catania Etna race. Surprisingly, he won at his debut. In November, another great result, the Carrera Panamericana in Argentina, finishing third. With these results and this incredible quick improvement in his career, for the team Lancia was almost mandatory to take Eugenio as an official driver, as a teammate also, together with the double world champion Alberto Ascari. But for the 54 season, Team Lancia decided to put Eugenio Castellotti together with Juan Manuel Fangio for the debut at the 12 hours of Sebring. In the year, anyway, Eugenio will score five wins with the most important races regarding the hill climb category, becoming again the Italian champion for the sport category. We arrive so to the year 1955, where not for the first time Eugenio is going to participate to the Mille Miglia, this time with a competitive team. He will lead the race until the city of Ravenna, where the car, unluckily, will force him to retire. Same year, Formula One Grand Prix of Argentina, he retires again, but in Monaco, finally, at the end of May 55, he will score a podium, a second placement in the Formula One Grand Prix in Monte Carlo. A race remembered maybe mainly because uh, Alberto Ascari, his teammate, had a problem, an issue, or maybe made a mistake and finished within the water of the port of Monaco. A few days later, 26 of May 1955, the Team Lancia is testing a car at the Monza circuit and Eugenio Castellotti is the test driver signed for that test. Within the general surprise of uh, the team and the paddock, during that test, 
Alberto Ascari comes to visit his friend Eugenio Castellotti four days later. His terrible accident in Monte Carlo. He is there without his equipment and should not drive like doctor said after a huge crash like that. But he is a friend of Eugenio. Eugenio in some way without a proper father in his life has recognized Alberto Ascari as a sort of virtual father and a virtual master for his career development. Talking with Alberto says, okay, if you like, it's not a problem for me giving you my helmet, my eyeglasses, and then if you really like, if you feel safe, you can run. And this was something like extremely wrong given all the circumstances, but nobody could say no to a double world champion, Alberto Ascari, that was feeling safe and in perfect shape to drive a sports car. Unluckily, like history says, Alberto Ascari will run just two laps and a half and will die in what today we call Variante Ascari for the Monza circuit, but that back then was just a left turn almost smooth, if you like, coming from the double Lesmo corners. Nobody knew and nobody will never know what happened really to Alberto Ascari, but for Eugenio Castellotti, coming to the crash scene, the crash area, was a shock to see his virtual father, his racing master, dead, wearing his helmet, and his eyeglasses. A sort of premonition, maybe, for him. Days later, in the calendar, was set the Formula One Grand Prix of Belgium, and Lancia didn't want to participate in a sort of sign of respect for Alberto Ascari. But Eugenio felt he had to be there and asked Lancia to receive privately a Formula One car to race that appointment, where after a fierce battle with Fangio and Moss with the Mercedes, unluckily for Eugenio, there was just a retirement with a broken car. 55 was a year of changes because the team Lancia withdrew from the Formula One championship and did leave all the cars, materials and spare parts to the team Ferrari, that from the night turning to the day after, did become the owner and the manager of the winning Lancia D50 Formula One cars, and also inheriting Eugenio Castellotti as an official driver. We are in the mid of June 55, it's time for the Grand Prix of Holland and uh, after Fangio and Moss with Mercedes the first Italian was a certain Luigi Musso with Maserati Eugenio at the debut was just fifth and not happy for it One month later Grand Prix of Britain Castellotti finishes sixth using Mike Hawthorne's car Despite these uh, last under expectations results Eugenio Castellotti will be classified third in the driver's ranking at the end of the 1955 season. With all the better hopes for 56 to finally win more races and maybe the world title. But sometimes the destiny is very harsh with some of us. For the 56 season Enzo Ferrari decides to hire Juan Manuel Fangio coming from the retirement of the Mercedes and also from Maserati taking another Italian, Luigi Musso. For Castellotti, not the best scenario to hope for a sort of easy path to the world title. The season starts for the Formula One category with the Grand Prix of Argentina and the first row is clinched by Musso and Castellotti. Castellotti then unluckily retired. Few weeks later, the 1000 kilometers of 
Buenos Aires for Sports Car, Fangio and Castellotti are set up to be teammates for the race. Again, some weeks later, the 12 hour of Sebring, still with Fangio and Castellotti as teammates, arriving first and clinching this classic endurance race. Second, anyway, Musso and Shell, still with Team Ferrari. We arrive in April, at the end of the month that generally holds the classic Mille Miglia road race. And uh, that edition was absolutely terrible, terrifying. A lot of rain, fog driving uh, up hill to the Appennini area. And uh, Eugenio Castellotti that from the team Ferrari has a specific strategy. Run as fast as you can. Your car at a certain point will break for sure. But at least if you run very fast at the beginning, you will force our contenders to do the same and maybe to break their cars. At that point, all the other Ferraris started with a strategy more conservative, will for sure have an open door to possibly win this classic race. Eugenio Castellotti does exactly what has been asked and what mainly he is capable to do. Drive flat out from the start to the end. He will win that race of 1000 miles, so 1600 kilometers, in 11 hours, 37 minutes, 10 seconds, after a fierce battle with an open car, an open top car, against the rain, the fog, and really the worst possible condition. Just as a footnote, the second classified Peter Collins will have a 10 minutes gap. Luigi Musso, third, will have 34 minutes of gap. Juan Manuel Fangio, fourth overall, will have 45 minutes of gap after just 11 hours of race. Something really crazy also back then. This victory will finally define who Eugenio Castellotti was. An Italian driver born with humble origins, with humble environment. From the night to the morning, transformed into a rich young guy, capable to basically pay everything he wanted and he desired, but knowing within himself that he was perfectly tailored for sports car. And this Mille Miglia absolutely demonstrated to the rest of the world that he was so for good. The season continues with a spectacular second consecutive title of absolute Italian champion. But without forgetting, at the beginning of September, the Italian Grand Prix held at Monza using the road and the oval section of the track that sees Juan Manuel Fangio for Ferrari team close to conquer the world title and uh, Luigi Musso and Eugenio Castellotti finally free to race each other and to demonstrate to the rest of the world who was the best Italian driver for that year. Fangio proposes a strategy to the two young Italians. If you follow me at the start of the first laps, I will uh, in some way manage the race that we can easily win because we have the best car available. Then, when uh, at the end of the race, around 10 laps before the end, I will leave you free to battle for the final victory. But even if this safe and more than sensed strategy proposed by Fangio and agreed within the team Ferrari is quite the logic thing to do, for Musso and Castellotti is pure and fierce battle since the start. They go to take the lead, they run around 260 kilometers in the oval section of the Monza circuit, and then with Engelbert tires that are not, let's say, the best type of tires available for that race, and they start to blow up and give many issues to all the drivers wearing that type of tires. After a spin 
at 260 km per hour exiting the south curve. At the end, both retire from the race. But the will to demonstrate who was the best Italian driver was higher than any other logic and sensed thing to follow. So, for the 56th season, Ferrari and Juan Manuel Fangio are finally capable to clinch the world title. And for the next season, the 1957, finally, Fangio leaves the Ferrari team to go then to race for Maserati, leaving five young roosters for the Italian Ferrari team. Castellotti, Portago, Musso, Collins and Mike Hawthorne finally free to battle each other. And like Enzo Ferrari said, the driver that after three races will have more points than the teammates will be the number one driver with all the support from the other to finally win the world title. For Eugenio Castellotti, this is music, but the 57 season doesn't start as Castellotti hoped. At the beginning of the year, there is the Formula One Grand Prix of Argentina. Seven Ferraris against seven Maserati is not a race, it's a battle, it's a pure war. And unluckily, Castellotti retires. He does a bit better a few weeks later with the 1000 kilometers of Buenos Aires for sports car arriving third. Then, at the end of February, there is also the race at Cuba for sports car, but nothing to remember properly. And uh, he's here that the destiny will come again to ask for his prize. To win a world title, Castellotti knows that must not only race quicker than all the others, he must be consistent, something not always in his hands, and especially he must uh, accomplish a lot of kilometers of tests to be sure to be in total control of his car. And the mid of March 57 for Ferrari is the period where it's important to test the new Grand Prix car easily also, because the test circuit is the aerodrome of Modena, a small circuit built in the northwest area of Modena city, close to where Ferrari and Maserati have their headquarters. The start of the test for Castellotti is around the 10th of March with Ferrari at this circuit of Modena, that is also a sort of a private flying club for who back then had the money to fly small planes. So not a proper circuit, but anyway used for many Grand Prix of Formula One, of sports car, Formula Junior. So not a difficult track to drive within. And for a, a, an ambitious driver like Eugenio, there isn't much stress for this activity. But between the 10th and the 14th of March 57, the day where unluckily Eugenio Castellotti is going to die, there is uh, the presence of Jean Berat with the Maserati team that the day before, the 13th, is uh, capable to sign the new record of the track. And uh, even if uh, it is not something important for any ranking, any classification, for Enzo Ferrari, it's very important to anyway demonstrate immediately that Ferrari cars are much quicker than Maserati. And so asks another time to Eugenio to go there to make a proper test and come home with a record of the track. About this story I did read a lot. The only book I would like to suggest you is Gli Indisciplinati, The Unruly, written by Italian author Luca Dellicarri at this point almost 20 years ago, I guess, where the story of Castellotti and the last days and the last moments of Castellotti are well explained and well told, also together with the help of Mr. Romolo Tavoni, back then sport director of the Ferrari team. I don't like gossip, I'm not here to 
tell you the story behind regarding the relationship with Castellotti and Delia Scala, a subret of the 50s in Italy, that in some way many put on the table to say that relationship was so warning out the nerves of Eugenio Castellotti that at the end he was not anymore a driver capable to manage a Formula One car. Nobody will ever know the truth. Nobody will never tell the final history like it was. But for sure, that day, that 14th of March 1957, for Eugenio Castellotti, there was not just the record to score on the Modena Autodrome. There was for sure something else not helping him to be consistent, completely concentrated and completely in control of his actions. What we know, technically speaking, is that the Modena circuit was very easy, almost with a rectangular shape, changed just for a chicane named the S. Stranguellini, where uh, there was the only hard braking zone for the track during a lap, and after some left and right corners, it was time to put the throttle flat out and then go back to the starting line. What happened in that lap to Eugenio, nobody knows. But what technically happened is that after arriving maybe late in the braking point, he tried to control a car too quick for that section of the circuit. And back then the usage of high curbs didn't help the control of the car, because at a certain point Eugenio had to jump basically the chicken and finished with the nose of his car against one tall curb that acted like a sort of jumping point that completely smashed the car and the driver for almost 100 meters, 100 yards against the stands built in that area after the S. Chicane Stranguellini. For uh, Eugenio Castellotti was not anymore talking about a driver, a future champion with a bright road ahead of him because he unluckily died instantly after hitting the ground and the stand with his body and his head. As said, nobody knows the truth about that. But what remains of Eugenio Castellotti for sure is the story of a man that did grow without a father having many years of difference between the two. But once he has become a rich young man, he completely committed to become a motorsport of the highest class driver of the 50s. He achieved it, he did a lot of great races and sometimes great victories, smashing some records and raising up the bar for Italian drivers like Alberto Ascari, his mentor, his master, his virtual father, did few years before. Was then up to Luigi Musso take the legacy of Eugenio Castellotti, like Eugenio Castellotti did few years before, after the death of Alberto Ascari. But the story of Luigi Musso is another one of this Primavera Ferrari, the Ferrari Spring, regarding the five young drivers hired by Enzo Ferrari, the Drake, that I will tell you in a couple of weeks. A terrible story, an incredible amount of lives thrown away in the worst possible manner, with the crashes that forever took away the possibility to see five bright futures of motorsport history. If there's a takeaway from this story, is that for sure money cannot buy everything if you don't have the talent and if you don't have the skills to succeed properly in what 
you are going to approach. But for sure, for Eugenio Castellotti, money were just the tool to be there and to demonstrate to the rest of the world that he knew exactly within himself he was perfectly cut, tailored for this job. As I said at the beginning, luckily in Italy, we do not celebrate properly Eugenio Castellotti, I think. We tend to remind more recent names that didn't achieve even half of what Castellotti achieved in his really short life and short career. And uh, I'm happy that in a couple of weeks the Mille Miglia for historic cars will happen again. Like maybe in the near future will happen again at Lodi, the Eugenio Castellotti Cup for the same category of cars. Because uh, for sure Eugenio Castellotti is a driver to be remembered also for the years to come.